Okay, Dr. Campo, if you're ready. Um, sure, yeah, one second here. Um, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the penultimate uh, uncharted territory of fall 2020 lecture. Um, we have one more, I just wanna announce, we have one more lecture and that's next Tuesday. Um, and I think that one is at 4 p.m. If somebody could uh, put the information on the chat, I'd be mo most appreciative. We have Chris Ryer, who is the planning director for the city of Baltimore. So join us next Tuesday at four for Chris Ryer. Today, I'm, I'm really excited about today's lecture and uh, I know many of you are excited as well. Um, I'm gonna introduce our speaker and then turn it over to her. Um, today's speaker is Janet Marie Smith and she is Senior Vice President of the Los Angeles Dodgers Baseball Club, the world champion Los Angeles Dodgers. And uh, she's worked for the Dodgers since 2012 and she's involved in the planning of uh, large scale improvements and Dodger facilities, both in Los Angeles and in the, uh, the team's uh, club home in the Dominican Republic. Um, today, I think she'll be talking more about her experience uh, when she held a similar planning position with the Baltimore Orioles and the critical role she played in the development of Camden Yards. Um, she's also worked on a number of other planning projects, uh, including Battery Park City in New York City and uh, unfulfilled plans for Pershing Square in downtown Los Angeles, as well as renovations of the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. Uh, Janet holds a uh, Bachelor's of Architecture from Mississippi State University and a Master's uh, in Urban Planning from the City College of New York. It's my pleasure to present Janet Marie Smith. Thanks, Janet. Thank you very much, Dr. Campo. It, thanks for having me. Um, this reminds me of um, years ago when I was working on Camden Yards for the Orioles. Um, what we were planning to do was not obvious. You know, there were many people wondering why would we build this old fashioned ballpark with new money? And so we were on a, a campaign of sorts, not formal campaign, but anytime we were asked to speak about it, we always did in the hopes that we could help people understand what we were doing. And one of my uh, talks was at the, uh, at the NSA, the National Security Administration, halfway uh, south of Baltimore on the way to Washington. And I got there and they had me all set up with the slideshow and all of that. But then the audience was behind a curtain. I couldn't see them because they didn't want anyone to know who worked in this high security place. So I feel a little bit like that with this Zoom call. I can't really see any of you. And um, I hope what I'm going to share with you today will have some meaning to you, uh, both because uh, as students of Morgan State, uh, you're within a stone's throw of Camden Yards, um, and also because having seen some of the projects that uh, you're doing at Morgan State, I feel like you touch on many of the uh, issues that we faced in developing Camden Yards from uh, planning issues, transportation issues, architectural issues, uh, the programmatic issues of what does it mean to put a single purpose building in a downtown that's full of multi-uses, and sort of last but not least, the graphic components, which really are like the icing on the cake and the, the things that make a building so special. Um, so I've, I've got some slides that I'm going to use to illustrate some of my points, but before I switch to the slideshow, I, I did want to just sort of uh, underscore sort of the last point that Dr. Campo made that um, my training is as an architect and urban planner. I never really thought of sports as being a career destination for me. I pursued the job with the Orioles uh, to help develop what we now know as Oriole Park at Camden Yards because I was interested in the city. I had studied urban planning in New York, as you heard a moment ago, and Baltimore was my case study city. And I had been assigned uh, along with uh, two other classmates, it was a group project, to dissect the city and really understand how it had changed from its industrial base 
uh, that carried it up until the 60s. And this was then the, the mid 80s. And, and so what had changed and how had Baltimore reinvented itself? So I felt like I knew the downtown and I understood the city from the project that I had done in, in college. Uh, which is another way of saying, don't ever think that your assignments are just academic in nature. <laughs> they will come, come back to haunt you sometimes in a good way, in my case. Um, and so even though I've now uh, been in and out of sports for almost 30 years, um, and probably my, you know, uh, my, my sports projects are the thing that, um, that people most like to talk about, my roots are still uh, deeply into urban design and urban planning. And I still feel sort of like the black sheep when we talk about sports, because it's how people use the building and how it relates to the city. That's really uh, the filter through which I try to always look at, at projects. I suspect that um, most of you probably weren't even born when we started planning Camden Yard. So that makes me feel really old. <laughs> um, and when I put together these slides, I tried to sort of uh, rewind the clock and help, help you understand some of the dynamics that we were working with. So I'm gonna share my screen now so I can go to my slides and see if I can put this in context. Uh, for you and hopefully many of you may have seen a game at Camden Yards COVID sort of uh, you know threw a, a real curveball and the ability to say let's go down there and take a look uh, when the lecture's over but um, what I wanted to try and help you understand is that when I joined the club in 1989 we were playing at Memorial Stadium and, and so I, in many ways it's probably a good thing that I, I had only seen one game at Memorial Stadium when I started to work for the Orioles because I fell in love with the place too. And I'm not sure I could have ever in good consciousness been a part of, of tearing it down if I had really known it as I came to know it the years that we were playing baseball there while Camden Yards was under construction. Uh, but as you can see from this aerial view of um, this building on 33rd Street, it was, it was uh, originally designed in the 1930s and really expanded in the 50s when uh, the football team, then the Colts, uh, came to Baltimore. So it was a multi-purpose facility and you can tell that the bowl is round and it was designed to accommodate football during half the year, baseball during the other half of the year. The seats were not really oriented uh, correctly for either sport. It had columns obstructing views, very small concourses, very limited number of restrooms. Concessions were pretty uh, rudimentary. Uh, and in spite of this sort of beautiful facade that was a, tri a tribute to, um, as it's, you might assume from Memorial, a tribute to those who had, had been in the war or America's wars, um, it had in many ways outgrown its time. And um, around the, the nation, um, we were seeing sort of similar things in cities uh, and this became the norm, these, um, uh, these multi-purpose buildings. Uh, and, and is this little bar in your way or is it only in my way? You guys have a clear view of my screen? Sorry. Yes. I'm gonna yes. Okay. Yes. So, okay. so these multi-purpose buildings that, that, that cropped up across America uh, in the 60s really became uh, the norm. And they were used um, sadly by uh, architects and urban planners uh, as tools for redeveloping the city. And often what that meant was wiping out, you know, literally three or 400 acres uh, of land to build uh, buildings that would accommodate football and baseball. And so from city to city, they all really looked alike. They came to be known as these cookie cutter stadiums. Uh, largely they were publicly funded um, and they were intended, uh, as, as many municipal funded buildings were, to accommodate a lot of things. So teams felt no real love for the buildings either, even though many championships might have been won in these, these buildings. But as you can see, from city to city, they really um, looked very much one to the other alike with the same kind of issues that Memorial Stadium had faced. Uh, the, the seating bowl being designed not really for either sport. You could be on the 50 yard line for football or be right behind home plate for, for baseball. And yet you were some 50 feet away from uh, the action. And as you can see in this image, uh, there are just as many seats in the outfield as there are in the infield. And again, these are 
different cities, but they all look the same. So you kind of get the idea because they were multi-purpose. Um, they often had AstroTurf rather than natural turf and baseball purists rather hated that. Uh, so there was always a desire to try and, and do better. Um, one of the things that was really striking to the Orioles um, who were led then by Larry Lucchino as the president was that these buildings, even though they averaged um, crowds, even though they had seating capacities of some 65 or 70,000, which was a requirement for NFL, for baseball, they tended, baseball tended to be a sport that had 30 to 40,000. So it always felt empty. Like even when there was a big, even though there was a big crowd, opening day, World Series, those might be the only times that you began to get close to 60,000 fans in the building. So you never felt the kind of intimacy and love um, of, the, of the building itself that so identified baseball with iconic buildings like Fenway Park. So let's talk about Fenway Park as an example of this sort of classic era of buildings, as you can see from uh, this image of the, the facade that was built in 1914. It's a very classic building without, its, without the lights on it. You never would have known it was a ballpark. It fit nestled right into the city, a very urban building right up against the sidewalk. The doors rolled up, the activity rolled out. It was just sort of a, a well-behaved building for our city neighborhood. And it celebrated some of the things about baseball that make baseball so much fun. Baseball is one of the few sports that doesn't have set dimensions for the outfield. The infield dimensions are set 90 feet between the bases, but the outfield dimensions vary from park to park. Even today, the year 2020, all 30 Major League Baseball teams have different outfield dimensions. And that has become part of the charm and part of the what makes the game fun is that there's something unpredictable and there's always this feeling that there's a home field advantage for the team that knows how to play the quirkiness um, of their home park. And as you can see from this postcard, um, the dimensions of Fenway were just nestled into the block they were on. There's a very short line down the left field that ends in a, in a, in a wall to compensate for that short distance. That wall has become lovingly known over the last 50 years as the green monster. Um, and um, you can see that while there are seats surrounding the playing field, that the preponderance of seats are between the baselines, behind, but between the foul poles, um, and the outfield seats uh, tended to be just very casual and just a, a lot of fun. Um, and one of the things that Larry Lucchino, our president, noted is that these parks, here we're looking at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, Forbes like uh, Wrigley and Fenway tended to have seating capacities of about 35,000. And yet consistently the older parks had a higher attendance rate every year than these big multi-purpose stadiums. And he, he felt there was something to that because it wasn't about the wasn't about what was going on on the field. Uh, the Red Sox and the Cubs both, uh, as many of you baseball fans will know, went for, for decades without having a, a title. And so Larry's feeling was that there was something about the charm of the place itself that made baseball fans view their home as unique. Those of you who are sports fans know that uh, maybe unique to all, all sports, baseball fans sort of travel um, and make a pilgrimage, a thing about going from ballpark to ballpark and sort of uh, note with, uh, with pride how many notches are in their belt, how many baseball parks have they seen. And um, these older parks, we felt in studying what should happen in Baltimore, really seem to be better urban buildings than the multi-purpose buildings. And therein lies some of the conundrum because um, in 1989, 1991, when we were planning this, we were planning, uh, we were planning a downtown ballpark. The site had been selected uh, in, in the center city, but there were many people in the state legislature who were funding this, who assumed that it too should be multi-purpose, that we should be building here in Baltimore a stadium that could host football and baseball. Um, and so in looking at these parks, it, was, it, it took a lot of nerve really, and a lot of conviction 
a lot of persuasion on the part of the Orioles to convince the city and the general public that like Ebbets Field, we should have an irregular outfield, that we should have um, seats that surrounded the playing field, that we should, like Boston, like Brooklyn, which we're looking at here, have a building that nestled into its surroundings that really responded to the city grid and let that dictate what should happen rather than creating a construct that was artificial, such as the ones that we saw in the round multi-purpose stadiums. We really admired some parks that I've never met. This park in Philadelphia was torn down long before I ever started even thinking about working in baseball, but yet in researching these parks, we found that these buildings which seem to resonate so with baseball fans all shared those things in common of being good urban buildings, being open to the city, uh, fitting into their surroundings and having an architectural style that was one to be celebrated. That wasn't just about sports, but it was about uh, the context um, of the city around them. Now, notably, one thing that happened in Baltimore that really changed things is the Colts left town. Uh, and they left town in this sort of famous move where they literally pulled up Mayflower uh, moving vans to Memorial Stadium in the middle of a snowy night in the winter. You know, it sounds like a novel, just telling it, uh, and left town and moved to Indianapolis. So you have to remember that here we were in Baltimore with uh, a baseball team that was owned by someone who lived in Washington, who had a year to year lease at Memorial Stadium, no long term commitment to the city, a football team that said the building's inadequate and said it so loud and so often that when they felt they weren't heard had moved. So here we are um, in downtown Baltimore with a mayor who's become governor against the backdrop of a city that's lost its lo the love of their, their love of their collective lives, the, the Baltimore Colts, and they're desperate not to lose the Orioles. And this is where my urban planning studies kind of kicked in because Baltimore is well known around the United States and indeed the world. You go to places like Barcelona and they have used uh, Baltimore as a model of how to reinvent their waterfront. The city may have grown up because there was industry around the waterfront, but that industry left when containerization uh, was introduced to the shipping industry and our inner harbor became too small to accommodate these large cargo ships that were then, then and now um, being used uh, for industrial purposes. Baltimore was one of the first cities to go into its downtown and to build the convention center and put it right in the heart of the city, uh, to build the waterfront, uh, to put an aquarium, a science center, create a collection of attractions uh, with the, the Jim Rouse uh, de developer authored uh, Inner Harbor Festival Marketplace. And while today we look at these things and maybe don't even think twice about them, if you roll back the clock and think about just how novel this was in the mid 1980s for the city of Baltimore to be putting these magnets downtown and saying, we want downtown to be a playground for everyone in the region, not just to attract tourists, not, not just to get rid of this sort of dying industry, but to be something new. Today's uh, uh, institution like the Urban Land Institute would call it urban entertainment centers, but Baltimore was well before its time with, in, with scripting these kinds of things and changing totally these decaying piers in the harbor, uh, these acres and acres uh, around the harbor that had been used for industry. And while we think of it as one way today, and even in some through one lens, we think of it as being tired and out of date. When you think about what was going on in Baltimore in the mid eighties, when this site for Camden Yards was selected, you have to remember that it looked like this, that what we now know as Harbor East, um, the the um, the Harbor Point site, uh, the growth into Bond Street and Federal Federal Hill was still an, a, a, a virtually a, a, you know a, a decaying Allied Chemicals plant, and you can see that a lot of this industry has closed. It's being cleared out. The EPA was requiring uh, cleanup, but meanwhile, look at the core of downtown and look at how committed the city was. And one of the beauties of having a mayor and William Donald Schaefer 
who went on to become the governor, is he really loved the city and he knew how to channel money, funds, and passion into downtown. So one of the things that uh, really went into his thinking was that Baltimore had, had he, he, he had championed this site, Camden Yards, for the baseball stadium. It had been discussed as a multi-purpose stadium. And if you research um, some of the early schemes, you'll see there was a dome stadium that was planned for this site. You'll see that there's another version of a round stadium that tore down the warehouse and created um, you know, another round park, just like the ones that we saw in Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Cincinnati. You can see from this slide that the convention center was still a relatively small box situated over just a block away from the, the harbor. And that it was surface parking lots that largely surrounded the area and very low scale industry that's set on the site that the ballpark is on today. The city commissioned a study that Pricewaterhouse did to look at this along with uh, 15 other sites and city planning was very heavily involved. And, be interesting to know next week when you talk to the, the new head of city planning, uh, how much he knows about the impact that his staff had on the choice of Camden Yards. Sort of hidden in city planning were some really staunch urban advocates like Evans Paul, who helped lead the analysis of these 15 different sites. And one of the things that I, uh, one of the stories that I really love is um, one of Don, William Donald Schaefer, who had also championed the light rail and putting light rail into downtown um, saying, I don't care what the study says, as long as it says, put it downtown. His instincts were that if Baltimore's transportation system, streets and roads, buses, light rail, the mark train could handle 250,000 people coming in and out of downtown, the traditional downtown every day for a, traditional Monday to Friday, nine to five job, that it could certainly handle 45,000 fans 81 times a year coming to the baseball park. And one of the genius things about selecting this site and, and building on the transportation systems that were already in Baltimore is that Schaefer felt that he could afford to build the stadium with very little infrastructure money. I didn't show you the ballpark in Kansas City, though I probably should have because it's an important step along uh, the, the narrative of how the Orioles convinced the state to build two separate stadiums. Kansas City had also built a baseball only park and a football only stadium uh, in the 70s. And it was an important model for that reason. But it was very different from Baltimore because it was out in a greenfield site. It is nowhere near downtown. And the city spent just as much money building uh, freeway exchanges, surface parking lots, finding a way to get fans to the Kansas City site in suburban Kansas City as they did the ballpark itself. Here in Baltimore, we were always proud to say that because we had this fabulous uh, connection to I-95 and to uh, 395 down to Washington, the Mark train stop literally 600 feet from home plate. Um, and we had all the parking of downtown and the University of Maryland already here. The cost of our infrastructure improvements for Camden Yards was only $6 million. So it was a very astute move, not only in terms of populating downtown with millions of fans every year that could help feed the restaurants, bring business to the hotels, but also it was just plain old smart in terms of using existing infrastructure. One of the more controversial um, decisions was saving the warehouse itself. Um, RTKL was hired to be the master planner. HOK was hired uh, to be the architect for the ballpark. And frankly, HOK had probably the biggest, um, the, the, the biggest assignment and you'll probably hear this um, in your studies if you've not experienced it for those of you in the workplace, but planners have a really hard time being heard sometimes because there aren't often tangible results of their work until a decade or two has gone by. But I can tell you with confidence that the city planning department of Baltimore and our planning firm of RTKL had every bit as important a role to play 
in designing Camden Yards as the architect HOK did because it was that side of our brains that led the advocacy for keeping the warehouse, for saying, look, if we want to be an old fashioned ballpark and we want to be like those sort of funky parks that we saw at Fenway in Boston or Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, you don't start by clearing the site. You start by working with what's there. And HOK really worked hard with us to figure out how to justify saving the warehouse. One of the fears of the Maryland Stadium Authority who was funding this project uh, was that saving the warehouse was going to cost more money than building the equivalent spaces in, in the stadium itself. So we had to come up with a rationale beyond just aesthetics for why saving the B&O warehouse mattered. Remember, this is a building that's only 50 feet wide, a thousand feet long. It's a very odd configuration. It was designed as a warehouse to serve trains. You know, you look at it and you're like, oh yeah, of course, the train would pull up right next to it, load and unload uh, out of Camden Station. So it wasn't like it laid out for very efficient office space, but we took everything we could in the stadium program that would fit into the warehouse and we put it over there. So inside the B&O warehouse, there are ushers changing rooms, the central kitchen for the ballpark, the loading dock for the ballpark, the trash compactor, the Orioles offices, now Masson's offices that are located there, the clubs are located there, the um, ticket office, team store. So we really tried to take to heart this idea that came out of the RTKL study um, that we could use the building, not just as a backdrop, but it would be a core part of the hosting the functions at Camden Yards. And by really working with those dimensions, it gave, it gave us a rationale to do some irregularities uh, to the outfield. And you have to remember too, that this is probably the first ballpark that had an asymmetrical playing field since the ones that were built in the 1920s. So some 60 years has gone by. So you can imagine people scratching their head and saying, look, is this gonna work? You know, I think even our architects who were experts in sports facilities, their latest projects, Kansas City, the new Comiskey Park in Chicago, they were still symmetrical parks. You know, they were baseball only, but they were symmetrical. And so this idea of sort of a throwback to asymmetry and the celebration of baseball as being different. Today, it sounds like, oh yeah, sure, because some 26 parks have opened and done it since then. But at the time, it was, it was very challenging to convince people that this was going to, to really work. And one of the secret weapons that we had was Frank Robinson, the up until this year when Mookie Betts of the Dodgers won MVP, and he was also MVP in the American League. Frank Robinson was was, was the, the only player who'd won MVP in both leagues. He had was celebrated in Baltimore for his role in the World Series uh, when the Orioles last won in 83, probably a painful thing to say here in Baltimore. Uh, he was then our manager. And so Frank had the credibility of having played in these older parks, that none of us sort of uh, in baseball enthusiasts or architectural enthusiasts could have had in, in advocating for an asymmetrical field and for what a difference it would make to the hometown team and for how important it was to sort of feel like you were of the city. And so um, with him championing that and with HOK and RTKL helping us um, analyze this site, um, we move forward, but with some other challenges as well. And one that I wanted to use this slide to point out is that in baseball, the best sun orientation on the playing field is with your third baseline view north so that you get the best conditions on the field itself. But what that meant to orient Camden Yards so that it would be sighted properly from a baseball perspective is that home plate where the majority of our fans were going to be was as far away from the city center as it could be. And so we were really challenged with like, how do we make lemonade out of these lemons? Because all of our parking and the mass transit is up to the north at the top of this slide. And so our fans 
who our estimates showed some 90% of our fans were going to be coming from that direction and entering both 50% uh, at the north end of Utah Street um, and another 40% down at the breezeway where the Mark uh, line, the Mark train line stopped. So our the question that we had to pose to ourselves is how are we going to make this work? How are we going to make fans feel like they had arrived even as they had another thousand feet to go to get to their seats? Um, we also were faced with a challenge of scale. How are we going to make this building not loom up over its neighbors? Now, today you see the Hilton Hotel, um, the, the, uh, the apartment building, the, the, you see actually two hotels on the site, the expanded convention center, add a sense of scale and normality to this. But at the time we were faced with um, being surrounded by row houses. And I'll, I'll, sh I'll get to that in a slide in a moment, but I wanted to use this slide to just point out sort of the good that came of this. Even though we had so many fans entering the outfield, it did mean that we had this picturesque scene where the downtown skyline was going to define the postcard view of Camden Yards um, and the warehouse we knew would be a signature feature. And it was important to us as we thought about this stage set of sorts for the scoreboard and the BNO warehouse to be in the foreground, downtown skyline in the background, and how to make our fans as they came to Camden Yards really feel like they had arrived. Um, I should have noted this, this is 1992. And so here we are 20, this, I think this photograph was taken some 20 years later in 2012. Um, and you can see how at once it's the same, but different because of the way the city has grown up around it. And this was the solution to our problem was an interior street known as Utah Street, um, spelled only as Baltimore can, E-U-T-A-W. And so it continues through the site. And the idea that we had was to make it a city street. So on a old, just any old day, a day like today, pre-COVID, I don't know what's happened with COVID, it may be shut down, but Pre-COVID, you could walk down the street, you could buy a team ticket, you could have lunch at Dempsey's, buy a, buy a jersey at the team store, just watch the grass grow with your brown bag lunch. Um, and it would be essentially an extension of the, of the pedestrian promenade around the Inner Harbor. And on a game day, we would put up turnstiles so that on a game day, this became a part of the concourse and that the concourse surrounding Camden Yards would be 360 degrees and that fans would be able to circumnavigate the, the whole of, of the building and be able to take in the views either in standing room area on Utah Street or in the picnic area that you see um, in the center of this photograph where the flags are overlooking the bullpen or you could go to the seat that you had purchased. But it was sort of a way of saying Look, baseball with nine innings and games that are two and a half hours long, fans don't always want to stay rooted to their seat. There's no half time to send you, you know, rushing out to get your concessions. So fans have just a more leisurely pace of enjoying the game. So much of these social areas were designed thinking about how fans could experience the game in a different way. As for the scale, we wanted um, several things and, and really wanted them um, rooted both in studying Baltimore's architecture and studying baseball parks. We wanted this building to be built of steel and that's significant because um, throughout the, the 60s, 70s and 80s, um, stadiums were all built of concrete and those multi-purpose buildings that I showed you, I think one of the reasons they had this sort of hulking presence was their building materials. Um, so aside from their scale being large, their building materials were massive. And yet, if you look at those older ballparks, they were not only designed of steel, but steel trusses and sort of a, a, a beauty to the structure itself or using bolts, not just welding that steel, but using bolts to connect them so that there was a, a lattice work like feeling to the structure. We, well, we felt an obligation to Ridgely's Delight, the community that you see here in the foreground, not to have Camden Yards tower up over it. Now those buildings are two and three stories high and Camden Yards from the playing field to that last row in the upper deck that you see in this photograph is 110 feet high. 
So here we are thinking, how are we going to take a 110 foot high building and feel like we're a good neighbor to a two story row house? And the solution was a combination of things. The playing field was depressed 16 feet. So that knocks 16 feet off of, uh, off of the total area. And then we made a conscious choice to only put brick on half of the facade. So that the brick covers the main concourse and the club level concourse um, with a little, uh, with a, little um, a little tower at home plate as a nod to the entry as you approach uh, Baltimore from the south. But we wanted the building height to not overwhelm the row houses. So the masonry that you see is only 55 feet high, which compared favorably to these row houses in Ridgely's Delight. And the street scene was thought of as just that, a street scene, so that we were thinking not just how did we host 48,000 fans 81 times a year, but how did we open up the ballpark so that it, people were compelled to be downtown and be part of the activities hosted at Camden Yards, whether there was a game or not. And much of what went on on Utah Street was, was just that, a nod to having a market, a team store, a kiosk that would be open so that the building was never closed on a non-game day, that it always behaved as a contributing force to downtown. And some of the things that we really enjoyed and just had fun with were thinking about the unique things to baseball and how could we take a building that was brand new and allow it to tell a story immediately. We were leaving Memorial Stadium, which for all of its deficiencies had hosted three World Series. It had hosted the, the, um, the, the, the football cults. People were feeling nostalgic about it before it was ever gone. And we were thinking, how do we make Camden Yards feel like it's instantly the home of the Orioles and not just the home of the baseball team, but home to legions of fans and, and their, the generations that would follow. So we, we thought a lot about not only how to give fans a variety of different seating opportunities at Camden Yards, but how to, how to do things that gave them something to talk about during the game, aside from the game itself. And some of our best ideas came from fans. Our bullpens are stacked in the left field so that anyone anywhere in the ballpark can see someone warming up for either team. And that was an idea that came from a fan. We used to do these fan forums, much like the trip that I made down to the, uh, to the National Security Agency, to get input from people and ask what did they want to see. And this was an idea that a fan gave us in one of our Saturday forums. Um, we also spent a lot of time thinking about the graphics and how they could tell a story about the history of the Orioles and how they could be unique uh, to, this, to this building. Um, we started out with this sort of little simple idea of doing chamfered corners um, in our signage and trying to think about how the various logos over the years could be used in concessions how we could, instead of having a museum, how we could celebrate the heroes of the Orioles with these retired number monuments that are sitting, you know, notice outside, not inside the gate. So that anytime you go to Camden Yards, uh, those are there for your photo moments, your Instagram photos. And sort of in the notion that everything tells a story, we worked really closely with Ashton Design who are based in downtown Baltimore on our graphics. Um, even when we had sponsorship graphics, we tried really hard to integrate them. So here we are with the scoreboard clock. Um, the Baltimore Sun paid for the sponsorship here, but we set this up so that the H and the E um, light up to denote whether a, 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 a ball is a hit or an error. So you don't have to sort of wait for the announcer to say, you can see it in the scoreboard. The birds on the on the on this this scoreboard are wind vanes, and you can see that the little bird on the right is facing a different way than the bird on the left, and that's because the way the wind hits the warehouse sort of kicks it off in a different direction. So when you're thinking about the pitcher and about managing pitches, and you're thinking about outfield, 
balls and what the wind is doing to them. You've always got this reminder on the scoreboard that the wind, the wind for sure plays a factor in Camden Yards. The logo that you see that's bookending the clock came from an 1890s Orioles logo. The B, Baltimore Baseball Club, is used in several places throughout the ballpark. And last but not least, uh, the Baltimore Sun letters in the clock um, are an idea that we stole uh, 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 without any embarrassment from the Bromo Seltzer Tower in downtown Baltimore where the clock spells out, guess what, Bromo Seltzer. <laughs> Um, we took this idea to our seat in standard and we worked um, with our chair provider to come up with this custom logo, again, using the 1890s logo, Baltimore Baseball Club, um, and the famous uh, silhouette of Wee Willie Keeler, um, so that there was a bit of nostalgia built into this. But mostly it was about storytelling and about allowing the architecture to tell the story of the Orioles history. Uh, we use the then current ornithologically correct bird on our gates. Uh, we put the Orioles Hall of Fame plaques out on Utah Street, again, rather than in a museum like setting. Um, years later, I had a chance to come back and work for the Orioles a second time and uh, with the, our current owner, Peter Angelos, uh, did sculptures dedicated to each of the six players uh, and manager whose numbers have been retired. Um, you're looking at Frank Robinson here and you can see how these are set up so that the artist Toby Mendez, who's a, a Maryland based artist who did these sculptures, thought of them as being something interactive so that when fans go down, and again, these are outside the gates, not inside the gates, so that on a, on a non-game day, you can go and be a part of the sculpture garden. Um, and then we had some fun with just some playful things like our bobbleheads. These are the uh, oversized bobbleheads um, from, from uh, various decades throughout the Orioles. And yes, they do bobble. Um, and so all in all, our, our goal here was to create a new home for the Orioles uh, that would break with the tradition of the multi-purpose stadiums that had wiped out downtowns and instead try and be a good urban building, not only in its architectural style, but in the way that the uses were prescribed um, and to use the graphics as a means of storytelling. And I think that, um, I, that uh, I look back on all those times that I went out on the road with um, with slides similar to this to sort of tell the story of what we were trying to do. And people would often say, how do you know this is going to stand the test of time? And I never had a good answer to that question because the answer is you don't. You, you do the best you can to try and have your finger on the pulse of what will appeal to the public and yet be forward thinking. And in our case, forward thinking um, included for sure, a foot and a throwback in time to those earlier ballparks, but with a real nod toward the urbanity that had put Baltimore on the map in uh, the last 50 years and with a sincere commitment to trying to make downtown uh, just as our um, Governor Schaefer had wanted a real playground for all of Marylanders to enjoy. Uh, so that's my, that's the end of my slides. <laughs> and I tried to leave time that we could just talk about uh, whatever aspects of this might be interesting to you from planning, transportation, architecture, baseball, whatever lens you'd like to look at this building and see what I could do to help answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Janet. That was fantastic. I think we all enjoyed seeing these, seeing, hearing your narration and seeing these slides. And I think even a few non-baseball fans were wishing it was, uh, you know, a regular like April afternoon. And indeed, as you suggested, that we could go down there and and take in a game. And um, it, it's a, I think there's just all of these small details that I think people have appreciated in the design of Camden Yards, but never really explicitly so. You, you, you brought life to them and that was really great. And also the survey at the beginning with all the, uh, the parks, both good and bad and middling, 
really helped kind of create a, a context. And I know there's um, a, a lot of questions. Maybe we could, um, we could do what we did last time in last week's lecture and uh, with the hand raising, I think maybe is would that will that work, Colleen? Can we do that? Uh, it should. Um, everybody should be able to use the hand raise function. It should be at the bottom of your uh, participants window where you have the button with three dots that says more. Um, and then everybody is also able to unmute themselves. So what we did before was if you can raise your hand or just indicate in the chat that you have a question, um, we'll call on you and then you can go ahead and yeah. ask your question. Okay. Laura has her hand raised. Yes. So this, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Um, so this was a fantastic presentation. I love Kenman Yards and grew up in this going to many, many games in the stadium. So I, uh, my question for you is transportation related. So as you may know, I-395 was came much later in all of the highway plans that the city of Baltimore had. Um, what do you think would have happened? Because you said that, that, that I-395 and obviously, you know, the Mark Station and everything, that their locations played a huge role in not having to pay for that infrastructure. What do you, what could, what, what do you guess would have happened if in Baltimore, one of the earlier highway um, plans was written was what ultimately went through, um, such as 95 being further north through Federal Hill and Light Street being used um, as the gateway in. Do you think that Camden Yards still would have been the location, or um, was in Camden Yards' location also influenced by the fact that all this planning started after? Um, 395 was? Well, I, I, I think your answer is the right one. I think the location was selected uh, largely because we did have this highway that dead ended here. And um, again, sort of think back to what was going on when, when, when Governor Schaefer and the Maryland Stadium Authority were uh, filtering through all of these questions and they were looking at these 15 sites. Washington didn't have a baseball team and 30% of our Orioles market was coming from DC. And so there was, a, there was a, one school of thought that we should put the, the stadium somewhere down around Laurel and be halfway to Washington. And Schaefer so loved the city. I just can't underscore that enough. He so believed in downtown and he, 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 he really drove to put things that would bring people to downtown and as a collection of activities, figuring that one plus one equals three. And so uh, we were able to take this highway to nowhere and give it some importance. And I, I can remember the first time I came to Baltimore when I was doing this study in graduate school of Baltimore, I can remember that overpass that like literally stopped, just it was up in the air and just stopped. And um, I know many of you probably know the story of um, the plans to put 95 through, uh, through Fells Point. And that was the first time that the Landmark um, Preservation Act had been used to apply to a neighborhood. I think sometimes we take for granted how forward thinking Baltimore was on so many fronts in terms of its planning. I mean, you guys have a great Petri dish right here in Baltimore for your studies at Morgan State. And then well, I'll tell you one thing I, I really admired about the way the Maryland Stadium Authority approached this project, they borrowed, hired, trick, pick what word you like, um, the best transportation guru in Maryland and David Chapin to come and be assigned to this project full time from the time this site was selected until the ribbon was cut. And David Chapin's sole job was to make certain that we thought through every lens of how to make the streets work so that they would host all these cars coming in filter out for people to park and then be able to get cars out without the kind of log jam that you see in many suburban settings. I mean, that was one of the important things was that, that Schaefer understood intuitively that the grid, the checkerboard of a city has more ways out and will dissipate traffic easier than even the biggest highways where everyone's trying to get on the same 
artery. Thank you. Another question? Um, I thought I saw whoever just had that question up before. Uh, Stephanie has her hand raised. Stephanie, okay, Stephanie, go ahead. Hey, so um, I know the, first of all, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I know that two stadiums were obviously always the plan. Um, and with new renovations to Ravens Walk, that kind of connects those two stadiums. Was that always the idea that you would have this pedestrian oriented connector that sort of connects those two stadiums in the larger master plan? Yes, it was. Um, now, um, I, I'm going to just uh, uh, offer an edit to your comment, though. There wasn't always a presumption it would be two stadiums. Once once the Orioles had successfully lobbied the state legislature and, um, and the mandate was given to the stadium authority to create these two stadiums, there was a lot of effort by the stadium authority's part to be ready for football. We had a mandate from the state legislature not to spend any money on a football stadium until there was a team here, but they wanted to be ready for it. And we were counting on all of these downtown parking places and the mark train and the light rail and all, all the aforementioned things to serve the Raven Stadium as well as I mean, what we now know as a Raven Stadium. They were still a gleam in, in, in the collective civic eye at the time. But we wanted to be able to make certain that we could see it was easy for people to park in the core of downtown and uh, the University of Maryland and walk to the baseball stadium. The thing that we wanted to make certain of and HOK worked really hard on laying out this site so that there was a pedestrian way so that you felt like the, the tailgating and the experience to get to the football stadium wasn't an onerous one. And um, I think Utah Street was always planned to be open on, uh, you know, as I said, it was open every day. So it'd be a natural on days when uh, the city was hosting football to walk down um, to walk down Utah Street and be able to feel like you were already at the sports complex, that you didn't have another 2,000 feet to go. Okay, so we have a couple of uh, challenging questions here. There's somebody named Vince and then uh, Samia Kirshner. Uh, Vince, do you wanna ask your question? Um, are you there, Vince? Somebody left a, a, a post, but let's let's go to Samia, and then um, we'll we'll come back to that question that Vince had. Hi, uh, thank you for a very illustrative presentation. I really enjoyed the photographs and the development of the entire area. That was really good. I hope it gets Thanks. published in some ways so that we can see the story behind the uh, Oreo. A uh, couple of questions, and these are really surfacing because I work with the uh, um, community uh, neighborhood organizations. How do you think the Inner Harbor redevelopment or the Oreo um, Park has uh, really uplifted the lives of the city residents? And can architects really start figuring out what would be the urban consequences of their designs above and beyond making um, poster card uh, visions and um, visual storytelling above and beyond. How do we start really figuring out whose pulse we are tapping on and um, um, who's, in the, who's living in the Petri dish? How are their lives getting better from these developments? I, I think the heart of that answer lies in making public spaces feel like public spaces and making public spaces feel like civic spaces. Um, there are many examples of public spaces being created that are de facto private by virtue of the way they are designed or by virtue of the way that uh, developers are somewhat gatekeepers for them. And one thing that I particularly appreciate about um, Baltimore's commitment to its downtown, starting with the, with the waterfront and the Harbor Place is that is as public as public can be. There is you know, no denying that it's a civic space. And much of what we were trying to do with Camden Yards um, under the leadership of Herb Belgrad, who was then chairman of the Maryland Stadium Authority, was to make certain that our 
focus on the public aspect of Camden Yards was as civic in nature as it could be. That we opened up the building anytime we could, not just architecturally, but in terms of giving people a reason to feel that they were comfortable there, that it was for them. The retired number of monuments, later the, the bronze sculptures, I, um, sort of giving you two 20 year apart stories, but when I had a chance to work for the Orioles um, a second time and Peter Angelos was um, an advocate for, uh, and, and indeed the, he, the Orioles funded these six sculptures, we worked really closely with the Maryland Stadium Authority and their architectural team to modify the fence lines and secure lines of the picnic area so that it, like Utah Street, would be open every day to the general public. So that these sculptures aren't just for baseball fans, but they're really for the public to enjoy. So I think the, the heart of your question has to do with a conviction that public spaces should be public and that public spaces are our sort of civic welcome mat. And um, I do think that architects and urban planners have a real obligation to the cities that they're working in to make that a priority. And it's not something that you ever really see. And in, in your question lies a, um, a, what is often a criticism of, of architecture is that it's thought of as an object building rather than its role of knitting together uh, a city. And that, that doesn't mean it has to be a, a ye old building or a con necessarily even a contextual building, but that it sh a building should recognize its place in the tapestry of a city. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a question that I'll relay from uh, Vince because he can't use his uh, microphone, but I, I want to just just point out to everyone there, everyone in the room right now, all, all the architects and planners, something I heard from the presentation earlier that I think about, about stadium design, but I think it's true of so many um, things that we design and plan in cities. One, design good urban buildings. Two, be open and connect to the city. And three, respond to local context. And I would also add uh, that retain historic buildings to the extent that is possible, right? And I think Camden Yards checks those boxes really well. And in a way that, um, that some of the stadiums that have come after maybe did not do, right? Um, but I wanted to also uh, talk a little bit about um, the finance of stadiums and uh, I think from, from reading about Camden Yards, it was very uniquely financed. And um, at the end of the day, the, the city itself didn't put forward that much money. But since Camden Yards or even before, um, stadiums and uh, cities and states have gone to great lengths to finance these, um, these projects and at the tunes of hundreds of millions over a billion dollars now to get something built. And that new stadium in Los Angeles for the Rams is what, like 2 billion or, or more, right? And um, some of this money is, is being borne by cities. And then we've got Vince's question uh, about, I'm thinking uh, eminent domain and uh, the loss of neighborhood fabric sometimes to the construction of stadiums and um, the, re the replacement being, particularly with football stadiums, spaces that are used basically a dozen or so times a year, right? And um, so I, I'm wondering with you, with your experience and looking across the, the country, you know, how do you reconcile the, the, both the physical and social and economic costs of doing these projects and we're seeing in places like Atlanta, they're already on their kind of second generation of the new generation of stadiums um, with the kind of joy and some of the things that you noted in your project. Well, uh, that could be another hour of conversation, so I'll try and keep it brief. Um, Camden Yards is funded by the state of Maryland. So one of the things that was a particular challenge and I suspect is a, 
uh, of uh, an issue that um, Michael Friends, who's chairman, of, uh, president of the Maryland Stadium Authority now, uh, deals with every day is how do you take a state building in the middle of the city and maintain it so that it feels like it belongs to the city and you fulfill your obligation to the state, but you build in enough elasticity that it can stand the test of time. And I think because this is a building that maybe uniquely is publicly funded, you see a real investment around downtown by the private sector, as well as the public sector. The, the state also, of course, funded the convention center, but um, many of the buildings that you see on the skyline are, are privately funded. And the way that the teams that are funding their own ballparks and stadiums are handling that today is largely they're buying larger chunks of land and acting as their own developer so that they capture the investment of the ballpark. So if you believe that the stadium, if properly designed, can be a catalyst for investment, then you would say the state invested in Camden Yards and the city of Baltimore has been the beneficiary of the surrounding development. Whereas in, for example, Atlanta, as one of the ones that you mentioned, Truist Park, um, the Braves themselves have controlled the development and um, thus their investment in the stadium is recouped by the development around it. So it's kind of an interesting thing that requires, I think, um, study maybe from some social scientists as well as us architects, uh, because it, to, to the earlier question about public spaces being public, um, you know, in, in our case, I think one could argue that uh, the way that the public spaces or Camden Yards are managed, they are truly public. Whereas in some of the cases where they're part of a private development, um, they are managed rather than public. Um, it's a subtle but important nuance in terms of addressing um, who your public is. Thank you. We, we've got a time for just a couple more questions. Max, do you want to ask your question? I see you, you had something in chat. I know a lot of you are putting questions on chat. We'll try to... Max, yeah. go ahead and turn on your mic. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much. Um, I guess my question's a little related to the previous one, but you talked uh, about the history of ballparks and how that is synonymous with trends in America. For instance, in the beginning, cities were densely packed and it showed in the ballparks and then suburbanization. And one could make the case that uh, Camden Yards kind of correlated or maybe even caused this revitalization for my generation, millennials, to come back to uh, the really urban like centers. So my question is this, specifically structure. in the industry now, what, you know, and now baseball has to compete with different sports, but also, you know, iPhones and people constantly being dis distracted, and now even the pandemic, what is the talk of the industry to kind of, you know, going forward for ballpark design? I think ironically, some of the areas that we created, uh, for instance, at Camden Yards, like the, the bar on top of the, the uh, batter's eye wall, the standing room above the bullpens, um, Utah Street itself is uniquely, I, I think, uh, designed to be able to accommodate that kind of changing behavior. You're right, when we opened Camden Yards in 1992, the idea that we would have a scoreboard devoted to all the out of town games and you could just look up and see who was playing and see the score um, was, was, was new and important. And today we've all got it in our pocket. You know, it's, it's, on, it's, it's already on the phone. It's not, it's already old news by the time it's up on the scoreboard. And uh, the way that we enjoy a game, I think, um, your point about the, your generation moving into an urban center, I think is uh, very much evidence that at the end of the day, we're very social animals and we like to be with other people. And um, it isn't just about sitting in your, in your 30 inch seat and keeping score and staying 
glued to everything that's happening on the field. It's just about the camaraderie of being together and being in a in a place, particularly you know, a, a, an outdoor place where you can sort of take in um, and sort of feel like your 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 goals at least for a three hour span are the same to see the home team win. And uh, so I I I think just because of the sort of social nature of people and uh, because so many parks have been designed with um, with the kind of fluid areas that um, that we see at Camden Yards, I think that there'll continue to be the kind of uh, in excitement about being in a crowd um, and hopefully we'll get past um, this COVID-19 and be okay being shoulder to shoulder again. But um, I, I don't see our attitude and enthusiasm waning. Okay, so just two quick, two, we're, we're, we'll have two more quick questions that were put up on chat. Um, and then I think we'll have to wrap it up, but. Um, sorry, I think yeah. Khalil also had his hand raised. Oh, okay, okay. Khalil, go ahead, you can uh, fire away. Hi there, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, I'll just be quick, thanks for this presentation. It was amazing actually. I didn't even know that there would be a lecture on Camden Yards, but uh, thank you for uh, covering it. Uh, my question actually kind of relates to Max's question. It's kind of ironic because I was kind of thinking the same way is how do you think going forward, um, going through this pandemic with really no defined end when it'll kind of be over, how will it kind of define how we design stadiums to keep everyone safe while also um, considering the fan experience, you know, kind of maintaining it or I guess um, recreating a new sense of fan experience given the uh, regulations were the well, pandemic. I think we were already on a trend toward um, loosening up the seating bowl. You know, you, um, I mean, you can, you can, I don't know if you can still see the slide that's uh, on the screen, but you can see just in the postcard view of Camden Yards that um, that almost the entirety of the outfield is very elastic. And I think that's a really important feature that um, you see more and more in um, it, not, not only in uh, sports, but in concert venues and theaters of uh, getting out of the sense of it just being a fixed seat and being sort of more, more social areas, which as I said, is somewhat ironic that we designed those looking and expecting for uh, people be packed in and yet those may be the safest and easiest places to social distance uh, during this time. But I, I think we're all hopeful that uh, there will be a, a post pandemic and we'll be back to enjoying uh, being in, you know, in, in compact places again together. So I guess I'm not ready to um, accept that we'll have to live with plexiglass surrounding us forever. Okay, two, two quick questions that were put on chat and we're gonna um, uh, wrap it up. Uh, the first one is a quirky one. Somebody asked if uh, the wind shear uh, caused by, I guess the warehouse was considered in the design or is that an accident? That's nope. the first question. The second that is question- taken into account. Um, HOK hired a, um, hired a firm in Canada to do a, a wind tunnel analysis, which they do by building a model of, um, of, of the ballpark out of plastic. And it still sits over it in the warehouse at the, the Oriole offices. And it gets submersed in water because it turns out that water and wind have similar properties and they use uh, a blue dye uh, to simulate what the wind will do. And so when Camden Yards uh, was under construction, the Orioles were concerned not only about wind hitting off of the warehouse, but they were also concerned that the being depressed 16 feet, and that was determined by the water table because of course we're close to the harbor. Um, they were concerned that there were going to be, um, that there was going to be wind coming off of the water that might change things. And so HOK put a lot of effort into making certain that we understood what we were getting. We knew there would be some impact. Um, but nothing that was going to be like Candlestick Park in San Francisco, you know, that was, that was the fear. It's like, is it gonna be something that's gonna be negative? And uh, the answer was no, the wind is going to blow. And um, 
They're going to be nights that it, it that it has an impact on the game, but it's not going to be anything so significant as to uh, alter in a significant way uh, the way that Joe Spear and his team uh, were laying out Camden Yards. Great. Here's the last one. This one's this one's a, a tough question, uh, or somewhat tough. Uh, uh, one of the one of our uh, audience wants to know wants you to comment on. Uh, uh, revenue generating enterprises around ballparks such as Ballpark Village in St. Louis or Texas Live in, in the new stadium in Arlington, which I think we saw in the World Series there. Um, also the Milwaukee, um, another one comes to mind is the Milwaukee um, Arena, right? And part of the argument and, and full disclaimer, I was on a, a documentary film, I haven't seen it yet uh, about the uh, the Texas Rangers new stadium um, talking about this kind of development and about um, the teams being ever more hungry to capture uh, more revenue, right? And potentially um, draining revenue from other smaller businesses through these ballpark villages, um, rather than people going out before the game, rather than going to uh, a place that's independently run, that's been there in the city, they're going to these other uh, places that where the, the revenue is being gener uh, captured by the team. Maybe yeah. you could comment on that. Yeah, well, it's, cer it's certainly a trend and yet um, it's no accident that it coincides with the funding source. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's no, no small accident that Camden Yards was funded by the public sector and the boundaries are drawn are, are scripted pretty tightly with an expectation that changing uh, this 90 acre parcel in downtown was going to attract other de development and was going to feed the businesses that were already there, the, the, the hotels, the restaurants, the parking garages, uh, that it was going to make it an attractive place to live. And so as, uh, as the clock turns and teams are being asked in this day and age, largely to fund the buildings themselves. It's no accident. They're looking to capture the revenue uh, from the ancillary development that back when municipalities were funding um, ballparks, it was fair and appropriate that the city would capture that. So I think there's a direct correlation. Now, um, looking at it through the lens of, is that the right way for a city to grow? I don't know, you know, they're, those feel like both cities to me, it, you know, no, no disrespect. I think Atlanta's done a beautiful job of um, scripting, especially their restaurants. If you've been there, you know, they only have local restaurateurs, no national chains. It was a real commitment and they've stuck to that. Um, and so there are things to be admired about that approach, but, I guess as a lover of cities, I can't help but have a deep affection for some of the grittiness that naturally surrounds a building like Royal Park at Camden Yards where it's the real city and not a scripted one that's just outside of the gates and control of the Maryland Stadium Authority. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks again on, on behalf of the Morgan School of Architecture and Planning community for a really lively and enlightening lecture. Um, I want to just remind everyone again that next week at 4 p.m. next Tuesday, we'll have Chris Ryer, who is the planning director of Baltimore City. So join us again for the last lecture in the series. And thanks again to Janet and thanks to everyone who showed up and great questions, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks for having me. Good luck with your semester. Have you read uh, Paul Goldberger's book, Ballpark? I have not. I have not. Well, I guess he, I should. He, he, you would be interested in um, his description of the very thing that you just mentioned at the end with this, uh, this trajectory. He rather divides his book into, um, I won't call them chapters, but sort of into eras. Um, the classic era, the ballparks of the early 1900s, the uh, multi-purpose era, which was publicly financed, the sort of uh, the, the Camden Yards and its successors of 
uh, PNC and uh, Philadelphia and Petco Park and San Diego and Coors Field in Denver, and then this later generation um, of parks sort of developing their own city and association with the ballpark itself. And I think it's yeah. kind of a neat, compact way of thinking about, uh, about that trend. For sure. I, I'll have to check it out. It sounds like a paper I wrote in 2000 when I was at Penn. Right. I it's, the same it's history, exactly. The same I think it's history. Uh, yeah. the, the ideas um, have been expressed in many forums, yeah. but he has a, a broader audience than most of us do. So it, and, yeah, and it's, it's a good yeah. well, well, thanks for the, the recommendation. Um, Send me like, your prize. I'd like to read your paper too. Uh, yeah, I have to fish it out. It might, it might have been wor written in Word Perfect <laughs> back in the day, right? Back um, in the day. Look, looks like there's a lot of people hanging on. I'm wondering, like, people must have a question. I don't know. If it, I, I see Laura, you're still here, but others too, or maybe they're just they just haven't shut down. Um, well, invite I, me back. I I'd, I'd well, love to have I've more been, conversations. I've been to Camden Yards with Laura Bianca Pruitt. So uh, yes, I, I, I need to go again. Pandemic. She bought tickets. She bought the tickets too, which was not <laughs> nice for her. That's Street or former professor. <laughs> Do you have another question, Laura? No, I was just saying that I'm not a good gauge on whether or not you should gauge about people hanging around. Okay, well. I'm usually the person that has to be kicked out of somewhere, like go home. Yeah, you're gonna get kicked out very, very soon. Um, I, yeah, I think maybe we should all get on to our next uh, thing that we have. All to right, do. well, thank you again for having Thanks, me. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, Janet. Bye-bye. Right, Thanks. Bye, everyone.